with it. Are you ready? Life doesn't always turn out the way you plan it. And as we're going to see through this next series we're going to do on the life of Joseph, we're going to see life doesn't turn out the way that we plan it. We're going to see him go from dreams to his destiny. And so turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to start with the first part of the series, first part of the, the story. We're going to continue the story over the next few weeks uh, as we go through. But I want us to look at Genesis 37 this morning. One of the cool things about Joseph is before there was Paul, before there was Jesus, before there was King David, before there was Isaiah, before there was Moses, there was Joseph. The book of Genesis gives more real estate to Joseph's story than Abraham or Adam or Noah. This is a very important story because this is the beginning of the people of Israel. This is the beginning of the Hebrew people. And so as we go through this, we have to recognize Joseph knew highs and he knew lows. He knew disappointment and he knew despair. He knew riches and he knew poverty. He knew, to, he knew a dysfunctional family and he knew about restoration. And we have to remember, look there in your notes, this, this one thing as we go through this series, remember this, God used people's lives in the Old Testament to preach a sermon. God used the lives of these guys and these ladies to teach us something. And in fact, God's word gives us not just the good, but it gives us the bad and it gives us the ugly. Isn't it encouraging, guys, that we don't have to be perfect? That none of us in this room, myself included, or any of our staff are perfect. We all make poor decisions. We all have bad choices. We all are sinners in the hands of God. And because of these stories, we can know that the Bible's true because it shows us these people everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So let's walk through Genesis chapter 37 together if we can as we go through uh, some of these verses. Uh, starting with verse one, it says, and Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings. Now, let's get this, get this in your head for just a second. Jacob's father was Isaac and his father was Abraham. So Joseph's great grandfather was Abraham. His grandfather was Isaac and his dad, the dad here is Jacob. And Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. So he lived in the land of Abraham from back in Genesis 12. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. Now hold up one second. So Joseph was a teenager. Any parents of teenagers in here this morning? Let's just pray now. Amen? Okay. So you can automatically see Joseph has got a couple of strikes against him. So he's 17 years old. He was pastoring the flock with his brothers. So they're shepherds. They're, they're out taking care of flocks. And he was a boy with the sons of Biha and Zilpha and his father's wives. I can't unpack that a lot now, but here's the thing. Joseph, Joseph's, Jacob, uh, Joseph's father, Jacob, had four wives. That means of Jacob's 10 brothers and sisters, 10 brothers and multiple sisters, there were four moms. This is a dysfunctional family, guys. I mean, think about the tension that was going on right there. And it says here, not only that, it gets better. Then Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So on top of the automatically crazy family dynamic, little Joe was a tattletale. And tattletales are not well liked, especially in a big family. So Joseph was running through telling about all his, his brothers and what they were doing wrong, it gets even better. Now, Israel, that's another name for Jacob. God, uh, when Jacob wrestled with God, uh, God changed his name to Israel. So Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. You parents in here who have more than one kid, you know kids are smart. They can tell if you love one kid more than the other or favor one kid more than the other. And, and because of that, um, the, the brothers knew this. And it says here, plain as day, that Israel loved Joseph more because he was the son of his old age. Okay, and then on top of that, Joseph decided, or Jacob decided to give Joseph a coat of many colors. You may be familiar with this from the Sunday school stories that you heard when you were growing up, or maybe there's a Dolly Parton song out about it that has nothing to do with Joseph, but it just says coat of many colors. But jo Jacob, his dad, gave the coat to Joseph. Now here's why this is significant. The firstborn was Reuben. Reuben should have gotten the coat. Reuben is the one that should have gotten everything because you all know how big families work, right? The oldest gets the new stuff and then what do all the other kids get? The hand-me-downs, right? So that means some of the brothers, some of Reuben's brothers probably had shirts that had Reuben bedazzled on the back of them that had been passed down like from three or four brothers, okay? And the point is, is it should have went to Reuben and then it goes on down. That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be fair. But Jacob didn't do that. Jacob gave it to Joseph instead of giving it to Reuben. Can you just sense the tension in this family? Look what happened. Verse four, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than his other brothers, they, what? 
hated him. They hated Joseph and they could not speak peacefully to him. It was so bad, they couldn't even talk to him at all. And then you go on reading, we won't read it right now, but you read in verses five through eight and nine and 10, Joseph had two dreams. These were dreams given to him by God. And Joseph had these dreams. The first dream, it, 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 was, it was about the brothers were gonna bow down to him. And what do little tattletales do in families? They run and they tell the little brothers. And so he told the brothers, hey, guess what? One day you're gonna bow down to me. And then he had another dream where the whole family bows down and Jacob or Joseph tells this story to everybody. He gets really arrogant and he tells them this. He's a little tattletale, he's spoiled, he's arrogant. And he tells them this. And here was what was Jacob, his dad's response. Verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. That's a good way of saying the dad didn't do anything. Jacob didn't deal with any of these dynamics. He didn't deal with the jealousy and with the hatred that was going on with his sons. Instead, he just sat back and watched. So the story continues in verses 12 through 17. Uh, the brothers go off and they're taking the flocks out to pasture and Joseph, the little tattletale, gets called to go take care of them. And when Joseph shows up on the scene, here's what happens. Verse 18, they saw him, they saw Joseph, the brothers saw Joseph from afar and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. Now I know the holidays are coming up, aren't they? Thanksgiving, Christmas, you're gonna have to be dealing with some family members. Okay, no, you're, you're sitting there pious. No, I don't know what he's talking about. You know what I'm talking about, that one family member. But I seriously doubt if you're sitting there watching them drive down the road and plotting to kill them when they come to Thanksgiving dinner. This is such a dysfunctional family here. And so they, they sought to kill him. Verse 19, they said to one another, here comes this what? Dreamer. They nicknamed him the dreamer. That was his nickname, and they didn't like that to be a nice nickname. They were meaning that to be very ugly and very mean. Here comes this dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. So they wanted to kill him and then throw his dead body in the pits, and he would be gone. His dream would be gone. They would be done with him. They'd be done with everything. And then we'll say that an animal has devoured him, and we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Guys, this is his brother's, and they're wanting to kill him and to kill his dream. Oh, it gets better. Then Reuben, when he heard that, now Reuben's the firstborn. By the way, Reuben had the most to gain if Joseph died. If Joseph went away and his dream went away, Reuben would become the firstborn. Reuben would then get all the first stuff again. But Reuben heard it, and here's what he did. He acted maturely. He said he wanted to rescue him from his hands. Let us not take his life, but instead shed no blood. Just throw him in the pit and don't lay a hand on him because Reuben was going to come back and take Joseph back to his dad and save him. That was what he wanted to do. Um, and so going on, so Joseph shows up, Joseph comes on the scene, Joe shows up, little tattletale Joe comes up to his brothers and it says they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and they threw him into a pit and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. Back at this time, they would dig pits all over the countryside. And what you'd do is you'd dig the pit and you would either find water or more than likely the rainwater would fill up in there and then you could get it out to, to feed yourself or to feed your cattle. And so there were pits all over. There's stories in scripture of people that accidentally fall in pits and animals that accidentally fall in there. And there, there were pits everywhere. And so they had this pit and they said, we're gonna throw Joseph into this pit. We're gonna throw him in there. And, and many times in the story, we just stop. We, we don't stop there, we move on. But let's camp out there for a second because we don't know what was going on in Joseph's mind. We don't know what he was thinking. What, what do you think he was thinking? Maybe at first he thought, oh, ha-ha, guys, great joke, okay? But then it wasn't a joke. And he sat there, and he was naked, and he was alone, and he was probably hungry. So Joseph's in the pit. So what do the brothers do? What do brothers do after they've already plotted to kill their brother and thrown him in a pit and everything else? Look what they did. Watch this. Then they sat down to eat. Okay, take this picture in your mind for just a second. All right, the brothers have just conspired to kill their own brother. They, they, they're sitting there and they sit down to eat and all of a sudden in the background they hear, hey, hey guys, what's going on here? <laughs> that kind of thing. And they're still eating. Can you see the hatred that they had for him? That they had for this dream? How dysfunctional this family had become? And then they saw a group of, of Ishmaelites. These are, these are traitors. These are people coming in. They were going to Egypt. And it says in verse 26, Then Judah, who was the second born, said to the brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? 
Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let our hand be upon him, not, not be upon him, for he is our brother and our own flesh. Guys, this is going Jerry Springer-ish, okay? Or maybe like documentary kind of thing. I mean, think about it. How many of you have thought about selling any of your family into human slavery? Don't raise your hand, okay? You haven't thought about that. Why? I mean, this is, this is some major family problems here. And so he says, and his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by. They picked him up out of the pit. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels. Guys, 20 shekels is not a lot of money when you divide it among that many brothers. It's not a whole lot of money. Why did they do it then? Did they do it for the money? No, they did it because they just wanted to get rid of him. They were tired of him. They were tired of his dream. They were tired of little Joseph always getting everything that he wanted. They were tired of that and they were ready to be done with him. And they took Joseph to Egypt. You go on in the story a little bit further, and uh, it says, uh, it, it talks about how then they took his, his coat, they killed an animal, they put it in blood, they brought it back to Jacob, the dad, and they said, Jacob, we found this, and Jacob started crying, and he went into mourning, and boom, the story should be done there for that chapter, right? But it isn't. In fact, if you look at verse 36, there's a, there's a little verse at the end of verse 36 that's a little bit, that shouldn't really be there, but it's there. It says this, meanwhile... While the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So Joseph is off to Egypt. He's done. He's heading that way. And we're going to press pause in the story for just a second. Because we want to draw from this some life lessons that we can learn from. Remember I said at the beginning of the sermon that God gives us these lives in order to preach us a sermon, in order to instruct us, to encourage us, to show us how we need to live our life. And so the first thing there in your notes, you can fill this in. Passivity leads to dysfunction. Passivity leads to dysfunction. When we are passive, it will lead to dysfunction. Jacob was a passive parent, wouldn't you agree? Did he, he didn't correct his kids, he didn't lead them, he didn't sense the jealousy and the problems there, and his apathy literally ripped his family apart. Dads, you're here this morning, I wanna say as another dad here that our responsibility is to lead. You know, when we get home and we're tired and we just wanna zone out, we can't. We won't be perfect in our decisions, Dad, but we do not need to be passive. And grandparents, if you're here today, you say, well, you know what, Russ, I've already raised my kids. I don't need to worry about that. No, grandparents, you can be a part of your kid's life and a part of your grandkids' life. I have a grandmother. She passed away a few months ago, and I can still to this day sense the absence of her prayers. Grandparents, be involved. And singles or students that are here, you say, well, how can I get involved in family life? Man, you can, involve, you can get involved by volunteering in our family ministries with our children, our preschool. You can get involved by getting involved with families that, that you know that are that have kids and that kind of thing. Don't be passive because passivity leads to destruction. And that's not just in family life. That's for every part of our life. If we're passive with our finances, we'll be in financial ruin. If we're passive with our relationships, they won't flourish. If we're passive with our health, then we will not magically become a fitness guru, okay? It's not gonna happen. And also in our spiritual life, if we don't have commitments and have goals, we will be passive. Ephesians 5 in your notes says this, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as, as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. So what are your goals? What do you want for your family? What do you want your kids to be in 10, in 20, in 30 years? I was part of a small group a few years ago, and we asked this question, you know, what, do you, what are your goals for your kids? And we all kind of, in the, the group, all couples and parents, we wrestled with this question. And I remember one guy, he had three kids, um, he was involved in law enforcement and, and legal stuff and things like that. And uh, we asked him, hey man, what is your goal for your kids? And he said, my goal is that they become productive members of society. And I said, so basically you just don't want them to go to prison. That's it, right? And he said, bingo, <laughs> okay? Um, not a great goal, but at least he had a goal for his kids, okay? Uh, the scriptures tell us that, that, that children are like arrows. And guys, if we aim at nothing, we will hit it every single time. Parents, where are you aiming your kids? Where are you, what are the goals that you have for your children? Next life lesson we can learn is this. If you have a dream from God, if you have a dream from God, others will not like it. 
They may misunderstand, they may not like you, they may hate you, they may despise you, but remember, people are not the enemy. We have an enemy, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers of the air. We have an enemy, but it's not people. They don't hate you, they hate the dream. In fact, look what it says, John 15, if the world hates you, this is Jesus talking, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Also, if you have a dream, if God's given you something in your life, that he know, a promise, don't wear that dream on your shoulder. Don't be like little Joe and be a tattletale. Don't be arrogant with the dream. If God has truly given you a dream, okay, and this is a dream that came from God, it's not something that you made up in your mind based on your own agenda. It's not something that was left over from some bad Mexican food that you had maybe the night before, but this is a true dream that came from God. If that's you this morning, have hope. And I wanna remind you that don't let man put a period where God has put a comma. Don't let man put a period where God has put a comma. The end of this chapter, verse 36, meanwhile. You see, there's gonna be more to the story of Joseph. Joseph, according to the brothers, should have died and stayed in that pit, but there's gonna be more to his story. And ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I wanna encourage you. There is more to your story. You and I cannot change the past. We cannot correct past mistakes, but we can change tomorrow. The scriptures tell us that his mercies, God's mercies, are renewed every morning. What that tells us is this, that every morning we should be remembered when the sun comes up, that we should, that all of creation is screaming to us, that our God is a God of commas and a God of new beginnings. He is a God of hope. He is a God of that you do not have to be the same as you once were. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, how successful you've been or how big a failure you are. We are not defined by others. We are not defined by our own abilities or our own possessions. We are not defined by our past, but we are defined by God. And our God, ladies and gentlemen, is bigger than our background. Our God is bigger than our bad choices. Our God is bigger than the dream haters that surround us. Do not let man put a period where God has put a comma. Do not let others say this is the end when God says, meanwhile, there's more to your story. The next one, there must be a preparation before the promise. For Joe, he had a preparation. He had a pit. This pit came and he didn't know what was going on, but it was there. And before he got to the promise, there had to be preparation in the pit. There has to be a pit. And sometimes we find ourselves in a pit. And this morning, if you find yourself in a pit, maybe it's a pit of your own making, or maybe it's one that you fell into, but know this, God will use the pit to bring you to the promise. God will use the bad circumstances in your life to bring you to the promise. It's really interesting here. Um, one of the things that, one of the pictures that you see here is, is about the pit. Um, who, which brother was it that pulled Joseph out of the pit that said, let's get him out of the pit? Do you remember who it was? It wasn't Reuben. It was, it was Judah. Judah was the one who said, hey, let's bring, let's bring him out of the pit. Come on. So it was Judah. If you look in scripture, the word Judah in Hebrew means to be praised or praise. Uh, in fact, it, it, if you look at the root word, yada, it means that it means to throw up or to cast. So to throw up or to cast praise. So there's a beautiful picture here within this story, and it's this. When we find ourselves in a pit, when we find ourselves in circumstances that we can't understand or we can't control, and we don't know what we can do, our job is just to praise. Our job is just to praise God. Our job when you're in the pit, when you're in those, those, those problems, is just to praise him. To say, God, I don't understand. I have no idea why the funding didn't come through. I have no idea why the doctor called. I have no idea why my kid is still far away from you or my family's messed up. But God, I will praise you and I will continue to lift up your name. And as long as I'm in this pit, I will praise you, oh God. Job said it this way. He said, even though... He slays me, yet I will still praise his name. When you're waiting, when you find yourself in a pit, just praise him. Next one, God will accomplish his purposes. God will accomplish his purposes. Do you remember the name that they gave Joseph? What was it? Somebody tell me. What was the name? It starts with a D, ends with Reamer. Dreamer, right. All right, so he was named Dreamer. Now let me ask you a question. Whose dream was it? 
Well, Joseph's. It was Joseph's dream, right? No, no. It was God's dream, remember? Who was it that gave the dream to Joseph? It was God. God gave Joseph the dream, and Joseph went to his brothers and his dad and everybody else and bragged about it and was arrogant about it and said, oh, my dream, my dream, my dream, my dream. Guys, here's the thing for us. God will accomplish his purposes, not ours. And when God gives us a dream, when God gives us a purpose, when God gives us a promise, it's not our promise. It is his promise. It is not our dream. It's his dream. And we don't need to get puffed up or arrogant or think about it in those ways. In fact, look at the bottom of Isaiah 55, verse 11. God says, so shall my word goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I I sent it. Whose purposes are we supposed to follow? God's. It's his purposes. And then the last one, the last point there, last life lesson is this. God is present even when we do not see him. God is present even when we do not see him. You know, the wrong question to ask when we're in the pit is not, is God here? That's the wrong question. The right question is to ask this, will you and I acknowledge God's presence? You see, in this story, you go, well, where is God? There's nothing in here, Russ, in Genesis 37 that says God is here. He, he has to be asleep at the wheel, but God is not asleep at the wheel. He's here. He's just unseen. And you and I can make decisions based on our interpretation of circumstances around us. When we're in the pit, we can make decisions based on that, or we can base our decisions on the promises of God and the fact that God will be there. One of the cool things about this whole story about Joseph that I just found fascinating. And, and just follow this in your mind as we go through this series. But Joseph didn't have the Bible. Th think about it. Joseph didn't have, it, when he was in the pit, when he was there, um, and he was in despair and he didn't know what was going on, Joseph didn't have scriptures like Paul wrote, uh, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, he didn't have the story of Jesus. Joseph didn't have that. Joseph didn't have Isaiah and he didn't have the prophets. He didn't have Psalms that David wrote. He didn't have the story of Moses. Guys, Joseph didn't even have the story of Joseph to encourage him, okay? Joseph had nothing there, nothing to encourage him. But two things, Joseph had two things to hold on to. The first was this, God, Joseph had this dream, this, this, this thing that God had given him, and he knew that to be true. The second thing is this, Joseph knew that God would always be there for him. Remember who Joseph's great-grandfather was? He was Abraham. And, and, and God had promised to Abraham that he would take care of him and all of his descendants, that he would make his descendants as, as wide and as big as the stars, as much as the sand and the sea. God, God had promised to Abraham that he would take care of him. And, and, and Joseph had been risen up in this family where God had promised this. And so Joseph knew two things. He knew about a dream and he knew that God was going to be with him. And that's it. He didn't, have, he didn't have Z radio music. He didn't have really, really cool scriptures on Facebook. He didn't have anything like that. All Joseph had were those two things. And ladies and gentlemen, I haven't lived that long, but I can tell you this. There are times in your life when the only thing you will have is a dream from God and the promise that God will be with you. And in that pit, that's what we need to know, that God will be with us. In fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus said, he would, do not be troubled because I am with you. In verse 18, he says this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Look at your notes. There's a, there's a verse from Psalm chapter 23 uh, that I want us to, to finish together if we can, okay? Uh, and it says this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want y'all to finish it with me. I will fear no evil for my bank account has a lot of zeros. Is that what it says? No. I, I will fear no evil because of who my mom and dad are. No. I, it says I will fear no evil because I have health. I will fear no evil because I'm young and I have my life ahead of me. I will fear no evil because I have a great job. I will fear no evil because I have a great family. No, fi finish it really with me here this time. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. You are with me. I will fear no evil because God, you're with me. You're with me. 